couple of weeks, it seems like I've been talking to a lot of people that are struggling with discontent and depression. And by that, what I mean is, usually they'll say things like, I don't know why I'm depressed. I really don't have a reason to be depressed. I'm healthy. I've got a, you know, a nice family or my kids are healthy or I've got a job and you know a lot of people would love to have the life that I do um, I don't know why but I'm just depressed and I cry all the time and but they can't pinpoint it they can't figure out a reason why they're depressed and then I talked to a lot of folks who are discontent particularly men discontent with their life don't like where their life is feel like it's it's not really amounted to anything or accomplishing anything with their life. And so uh, the folks are discontent. They're looking for that next thing, whether it's the next job, the next thing they do, have, acquire, buy. And, and maybe with that, I'll get uh, happy and contented. Of course, in the process, they're driving their wives nuts about, you know, what's it going to take to make you happy. This usually revolves around two things this discontentedness and this depression. It usually revolves around self-image and it revolves around purpose of life. And when you don't feel good about yourself, when you feel like you don't have a significant purpose for your life, that breeds a discontentedness in your life, which can also create a depression in your life. And what's so tough on people is when they can't figure out why that is. Now, also, a lot of us wonder why people just can't get along in life. You pick up the newspaper, you go online, you see TV, and you see, you know, how people are just in conflict with one another on a national level, you know, on an international level, uh, in families. I mean, just uh, the, the fights, the bickering, the wars, all that stuff that goes on. And we sometimes say to ourselves, why can't we just be nice to each other? Why can't we just get along with each other? What's wrong with humanity? Well, the simple answer to that is what we've seen so far. That the simple answer would be the fall. Sin. We were creating the image of God. And we said, well, we're creating the image of God, so we should be getting along. I should be contented with my life. I should be happy with my life. You know, I, I shouldn't be depressed about it. You know, I, I have this relationship with God. But the fall or sin has ruined all that. But today I want to go into a little more detail. If you know someone, or maybe you're a person like that, struggling with discontent or depression, and I can relate to that. I've spent a lot of years of my life, you know, discontent, looking for that next thing. You know, like, okay, it's always out there in the future, just a little bit out of reach. If you know someone like that, or you're struggling with that, I want to talk about two reasons for that and one solution. Two reasons why I think that happens that we find here in the scriptures from the passage I just read. Two reasons and one solution. And so let's look first of all at the two reasons. Notice here in verse 16. In verse 16 we have one of the saddest expressions in the Bible. And you find it at different places scattered throughout the Bible. But notice it. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and sell in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Notice that little, little expression there. Went out from the presence of the Lord. Just a few little words. Went out from the presence of the Lord. But great significance, great impact on our life. It's just a few words. It's so simple, and most people are so used to living like that, that they don't see what the big deal is. Going out from the presence of the Lord. You know, when you go out from the presence of the Lord in your life, there's only one direction for your life to go, and that's down. Now, notice what it says here. Cain, we understand why. You know, Cain killed his brother. He was disobedient to God. He was self-willed. He was determined to do things his own way. He wouldn't worship God or come to God the way God said. You know, he was just stubborn and prideful and I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to bring the offering that God says to bring. I'll bring the uh, of what I have worked and raised from the ground. 
And God rejected that. And in his stubbornness and anger, he ends up, you know, not only angry at God, but then takes it out on his brother Abel and kills him, angry at him. And so we know that when Adam and Eve sinned, they were put out of the garden. And notice here now that when Cain sins and God puts the curse on him, that he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He goes out from the presence of the Lord and he goes east. In other words, here's the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are in it with the presence of God. And what happens to them? They sin and rebel against God. They're placed out of the garden. But God does teach them how, even in the, under this curse, they can maintain God's presence in their life by bringing that blood sacrifice. But Cain rejects that. And then what does Cain do? Cain goes even farther away than his parents. He goes farther east, out from the presence of the Lord. Farther away, alienated from God, alienated from his parents, from his family, to the land of Nod. Nod means wandering. And I think here in that land of Nod, as he mentions it, it's such a picture of what happens to our life when we go out from the presence of the Lord. That's basically what we end up doing in our life. We wander. We have no direction. We, we have no real purpose, no real meaning. Remember the children of Israel when they were went to Kadesh Barnea and they're on their way, they're going out from Egypt on the way to the promised land. And they stop at Kadesh Barnea and they send the spies out to check out the land. And they come back, 12 spies, and say, yeah, it's everything God says, a beautiful land, milk and honey and all of that, but there are giants in the land. 10 of the spies said, yeah, those guys are gonna kill us. 10 brought back an evil report, two brought back a good report. And so that the 10 that brought back the evil report kind of put fear in the hearts of the whole nation and turned the nation, and they were unwilling to go up. And God said, all right, out of their uh, punishment for that and their disobedience to that, uh, what they end up doing, they ended up out of that disobedience. They, God said, all right, if you're 20 years old and up, you'll wander and die in the land. So you think about that, though, what it must be like to spend the next 40 years of your life just wandering. All they did was going around in circles, that generation. It's like they, out of their unbelief and disbelief of God, they wouldn't trust God and obey Him. God said, all right, you don't get to go in the land. So what do you do? You just wander around. And I think that's what, at the root of, for a lot of people, of their depression and their discontentment is it's that unbelief and because they won't trust God and they won't decide to follow God with their life and live in faith and walk in faith, well, they just wander. And that, that after a while, you know, you can try a lot of different things to make your life uh, have meaning to it and have significance to it, but people end up depressed and they end up discontented because they just feel like their life isn't going anywhere. And that's because they refuse to live by faith. Faith is just a simple thing. I'm going to read God's Word. I'm going to believe God's Word. I'm going to act upon it. Because you and I are created by God for significance, for purpose. That's why it's such a desire in us. God made us for that. We are created in His image, which means we are to represent Him in the world. They're living on this higher level. And so we, we have that in us. We just feel like, well, you know, people have that feeling and they'll express it many times, I just feel like I should be doing something more with my life. I just feel like my wife, should, my, my life should have more significance to it. I, it should have more meaning to it. Well, why do we all feel like that? You're not unique in that. We all have that desire. We're created by God for that because we're created to bear His image, to represent Him. We're designed for a purpose. And the only way you find that is to live out in the presence of God. Remember, uh, I think it was the first president, Bush, coined that old term, the uh, phrase, a thousand points of life. You know, living like your, your life is like a city on a hill and giving out the thousand points of life. And that's the way you and I, as people of faith, and people that are Christ followers, that's how our life takes on meaning and purpose. We become a point of light. And so when we disperse from here, and we go to our homes and our neighborhoods and our schools and our jobs. We become that point of light. And a lot of times we look for the significance and the meaning in achieving some great thing. Some huge thing that is going to, you know, put you in the history book or make you famous. 
But that's not so much what it is. It's about living as that point of light in your world where you're planted. Because that, when you become that point of light and that representative to God, that becomes a significant thing to someone else. So what is insignificant to us, think about that. What sometimes is insignificant to us is very significant to another person that we made a difference in their life. Has somebody ever come up to you at any time and thanked you or reminded you of something that you did that you totally weren't aware of it or you forgot about it? It didn't seem like anything. Sometimes that's our kids, our grandkids. Sometimes it's a person. And we didn't think much about it. We just gave a passing word or it was a small deed or act of kindness. And that impacted their life, changed their life, encouraged them at a low point in life. And we totally forgot about it. We didn't think it was important at all. But to them, it was very significant. So the truth is, you and I have the opportunity to do significant things with our life all the time. We just don't see them as significant. What do our kids remember that we totally are oblivious to? What do our grandkids remember about us that they think nothing about? But it was significant to them. So when you think about living with significance and purpose and direction, it's when you and I come into the presence of God and live out His truths, that's how we're supposed to live. That's where our life takes on uh, significance and purpose, and, and that's how you get rid of discontent, and that's how you get rid of the depression, feel like your life is going nowhere. Most of the people in the world live like that generation of Israel wandering in the wilderness, because they won't listen to God. Today, they're not, you know, in the church, they're not uh, worshiping God, They're, they don't read their Bible, you know, each day. They don't hunger for God, have a heart for God, and want to know what God has said to them. They're just out there on their own, doing their own thing. And that's why we have so many depressed people in the world. That's why so many folks are discontent, is that they just feel like, well, I'm here, but, you know, what's my life about? What's it for? Because they're just living it on their own. Now, you and I are strangers and pilgrims, the scripture tells us. So in one sense, we, we wander as strangers and pilgrims, but we have direction because we're looking for the heavenly city. We're on our way someplace. We're on our way home. And on the way, we live as a point of light. On our way. And, and just think about this today. When you and I leave here, we're going to go out. And I don't know what your plans are today. I'm not even sure what my plans are. i got to check my wife. You don't know what opportunity you're going to have today to make a significant difference in somebody's life by a simple act. Quit looking for the huge things. Quit looking for the world-changing events. The truth is most of us aren't going to do that. And then we feel like our life is meaningless and insignificant. And we miss the whole point of why we're created. Think about Jesus. What did he do aside from the cross, aside from the very end of his life, Dying on the cross, raising from the dead, but through the course of his life and ministry, what huge things did he do? He didn't build some big mega church. I mean, he didn't, you know, he worked miracles, he did different things, but his life was very ordinary. It was very just day by day, touching this life and that life and teaching and being authentic and living out the truth of Scripture and, you know, caring about people and touching a life here and a life there and a life there. And you and I have to understand, what does that purpose mean? What does that significant mean? It comes from living that way. And you know, once you and I remove our life from God's presence, every generation that comes from us grows spiritually weaker and more depraved. It's like making a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And so here in Genesis chapter 4, you read the genealogy that comes from Cain, that ungodly seed. And it culminates, we only get about seven down. The seventh from Adam is Lamech. And we see how depraved this guy is. But we see that truth that once a one generation removes themselves from the presence of God, it's going to have very negative consequences on the next generation. Romans chapter 1 lets us see that and has insight. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We know what the truth is, but we suppress it. You know, I don't want to know what the truth is because that which is known about God is evident within them. 
God has put certain knowledge about himself in us, in our conscience. But God made it evident. It's evident. It's there. And we try to shut it down and reject it. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, invisible attributes about God, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How? Where? Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So he says creation tells us about God. It tells us about the nature of God, the attributes of God, the power of God. And so everyone, everywhere in the world has creation. You can't go anywhere in the world without seeing creation. Amen? You can't be anywhere in the world without seeing the, the stars, the sun, the moon, the sky, uh, whatever the, the world looks like where you are. And so we, we learn stuff about God. You know, that somebody made that, and he's a powerful being, and he's a God of order and wisdom. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So he said they knew this truth. They could see it in creation. God put it inside of every human being, but we chose to reject it. We chose to say, I don't want that truth. And I am going to depart from the presence of God. And so God said, all right, if that's what you want, go ahead. And we decided we would worship the creature rather than the creator. We would worship what God made instead of the God himself. And in so doing, the scripture says God gave us over to a depraved mind. And so what happens? That each generation that departs from God, we get more and more and more wicked. Each generation is more and more and more under the curse. So Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart, no God. There is no God. I mean, there is no God for me. So life without God is meaningless and empty. That's what the preacher said in Ecclesiastes. It's vanity. It's all vanity. Why are so many people depressed? Why are so many people discontent? Why are some of you unhappy with life? And so they're trying to find it in all sorts of other things because they have chosen to go out from the presence of God. They're, they're like the fellow in the story of the Good Samaritan that left Jerusalem and he went down to Jericho. And whenever you and I leave Jerusalem, that was the city of God. That's where God put his presence. And he left and went to Jericho. Whenever you leave the presence of God, your life is only going to go one direction, down. It's going to go down. And so we see that in the genealogy of Cain. And I'm talking to somebody today that in the back of your mind is that thought, you know, my life was doing better when I was closer to God. You ever have that thought before? I was doing better in my life when I was closer to God. Our marriage was doing better when we were closer to God. Things were going better in my life when I was closer to God. And so one, one of the reasons for this problem is that people leave God's presence. We have free will. We can stay in his presence or leave it, and Cain chose to leave it. So one reason is leaving the presence of God. What's one reason? Leaving the presence of God. Say that with me. Leaving the presence of God. Here's the second reason, listening to the lie. Romans says that. We chose to worship the creature over the creator. And we see that in Cain and his descendants in verses 17 through 19. We have that genealogy of Cain, and they believe the lie instead of God's truth. What is the lie? The lie was first told in the Garden of Eden when the devil came to Eve and said, Eve, if you eat of that tree, you will be like God. Here's the lie. The lie is you are the center of all things, not God. 
You are the center of all things, not God. You can become your own God. You can become like God. You can become the center of your world, the captain of your ship, the master of your faith. If you leave the presence of God, you can become your own God. That's the lie. We call that humanism. Man-centered life. And that's what the humanist believes. It will all revolve around me. And you see that on a large level. You see it on a small level. You see it all the time in people and their actions. We call people like that that everything wants to revolve around them narcissists. Well, we all have a little bit of that in us. Amen. But on a continuation, when, you, when you're down here like an 8 or 9 or 10 on that level, people like that, they make wonderful first impressions. People think they're great. Greatest things in sliced bread. What a wonderful guy. What are we, you know, it's wonderful. But that is all. It's like the, the spider saying to the fly, come on in. And once they get you in, once they, you know, bring you into their sphere of influence, particularly in marriage, once they married you, everything changes and you realize you exist for one purpose. Me. Make me happy. That's all you're here for, is to make me happy. Make my life wonderful. And uh, they will abuse and misuse and verbally abuse and manipulate and control because they believe the lie. It's all about me. And people can believe that to lesser degrees, but life is all about them. And that's the lie. The truth is, it's all about God. Amen? It's the exact opposite. So here's Cain. He made it all about him. He wasn't going to come God's way. He wasn't going to bring God's offering. And so he kills his brother, and God curses him, and God says, now you're going to wander. You're going to be vagabond in the earth. You're going to wander around. And what does Cain do? Well, we find here that Cain goes out and he builds a city. He builds a city. He names it after his son. God said, you're going to wander. Cain, oh, no, I'm not. Once again, Cain says, I'm going to redeem myself. I'm going to remove this curse my way. I'm not going to listen to God. We're going to build a city. I'm going to name it after myself, after my son. You know, and I'm, I'm going to put my name up there. I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to accomplish something. And people have been doing that ever since. Remember the story of the Tower of Babel? God says, I want you to multiply in the, in the world and fill the earth. And people say, no, we can't do that. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to build a monument to ourselves while we still have the control and the power before we get scattered all over the world. So he said, let's build a tower to the heaven. It was called Babel. Confusion, chaos. What were they doing? They were saying, we don't care what God says. We're going to build something and put our name on it and exalt ourselves. And so Genesis begins in a garden with God, the presence of God. And the Bible closes, the book of Revelation, it ends with a garden in the heavenly city in the presence of God. With the tree of life again and the water of life that flows. But in between we find Cain and his seed constantly trying to build lives and build cities without God. And people do it today. What have we done as a nation? We have said we don't need God. A nation that was founded upon, you know, the Judeo-Christian faith, the principles of the Old and New Testament, our legal system was set up that way, and our values, and our morals, and our ethics, and so today, what do we do? We kick God out of our culture, we take Him out of our schools, we take Him out of our government, we take Him out of everything. And we say, no, you can't have God. You can have, you can have every God but the God of the Bible. You can't have the God of the Bible because we are petrified of the God of the Bible. So we're going to take him out. We're going to redefine sin. We're going to call sin as righteousness. We're going to take righteousness and call that sin bad and evil. And you look around and see what we're reaping in our culture. Look what's happened to our homes and our families and our marriages and our cities. You see what's going on. You see the social consequences. You see all the consequences. You know, how many people are in prison and pornography and drugs and crime and all that. You know why? Because we've gone from the presence of the Lord and we believe the lie. We don't need God. It's all about me. And the lie gets passed from generation to generation. And you see that in the ungodly seed. You follow the, you follow the, the, the lineage of um, Cain and you come to a guy named Lamech. And Lamech is the first guy... Stupid, but he thought he had a better idea. He said, I'm going to get two wives. Two wives. God says one wife. 
Amen. 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 How many wives did God bring to Adam? One. Now, if God wanted him to have two or three, don't you suppose he'd be? He says, no, here's what it's going to be. One man, one wife. One man, one woman for a lifetime. That's marriage. And so Meg says, well, you know, I got a better idea. Hey, I can multiply a lot more if I have two wives. And he's the first one in the Bible to do that. And then you find that throughout the scripture. Polygamy. He brings it in. That becomes part of a lot of people's cultures. And you start to even see how culture influences God we see. Because you go through the Old Testament and you can see people like David and other patriarchs who had multiple wives. But when you see that, that's a cultural thing. They embrace that was not God's plan. And you always find problems in families when you have that. You know, you have sibling rivalry when you have one husband, one wife. And if you have a blended family, if you've been married, divorced, and have her kids and your kids and our kids and my kids, you know how much more complicated that gets. And the rivalries and the conflicts and the things that get set up, and you, the more wives you go through and the more husbands you go through, and, and then if you try to put them all together in one place, you know, we make, we make TV shows now about that stuff. And because we try to normalize it all to make it feel like it's okay. But the reality is, you get down where people really live, I don't care what they say, when you get two women in love with the same man, you got problems. Or you get two men in love with the same woman, you're going to have problems. You see that with in laws, that's the problem. You got wife and mother in law, they both love the same guy. And boy, you know, if you're a husband and you start comparing, you know, you don't think that as good as my mom did. Uh-oh, you're going to have problems. You're going to have big problems. Or why can't you be more like my dad? Oh, you're going to have problems. You know? So God knows what he's doing. If God designed something, he says that way because he's why He knows what it's all about. And so here, here's what we have. This lie gets passed from generation to generation, and it just keeps getting worse. And then Lamech, he gets his wives together and, say, and he brags on the fact that he's killed a guy. He says, hey, listen, I killed a guy that wounded me. And so, you know, if God is going to take vengeance on anybody who kills Cain, how much more justified am I in killing somebody that wounds me? And so he's bragging about it, and he's just showing his, his independence, his arrogance, his pride, I am master of my own fate. For God tells us in Deuteronomy 32, 35, that vengeance is his. But again, it goes back to that idea, I will be my own God. Once I become my own God, I make the rules. I do what I want to do. It's all up to me. And that's, that's our culture today. Every man does that which was right in his own eyes. It's not a new thing. You have it back in the book of Judges. It's part of that sin nature. And so as human beings, we tend to live in extremes of either I'm master of my own fate. I can do my own thing, make it all happen on myself, or I have no control whatsoever. It's just fate. If it's to be, it's to be. And we don't have the balance of the sovereignty of God, the free will of man. And Satan, who is the father of lies, is that deceiver and counterfeiter. So he's always pushing his seed rather than God's seed. His kingdom rather than God's kingdom. His will rather than God's will. His lie versus God's truth. And so when you look today and we see so much discontent and unhappiness and depression, it's because, one, people choose to leave the presence of God. I don't need it. And number two, they choose to listen to the lie. What are those two reasons? Why do we have that? They do what? Leave, say it with me, leave the presence of God. And two, listen to the lie. So there's the two problems that leads to so much discontent and so much depression in people's lives. What's the solution? The solution is learning the truth. Look at verse 25 here of chapter 4. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in the place of Abel, for Cain killed him. So God gave them now another son. They named him Seth. She said, God gave me this other offspring, or literally the word is seed. 
Remember in Genesis 3.15, God said there's going to be this conflict between these two seeds. The seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. The godly seed, the ungodly seed. Human beings, but spiritually different. One would be a people of faith, one would be a people of unbelief. One would want to believe God in His truth, and one would rather believe the lie. I can become my own God. And so, Abel has been killed. And God replaces him and starts anew the godly seed as he has promised. For there has to be this godly line for the Messiah to come. God's promise, God's plan of redemption to overcome the whole curse of the universe. And the devil tried to destroy God's plan, tried to destroy God's word by destroying Abel. But he can't. And he did that. You study the Old Testament and he goes all the way through there trying to wipe out the people of God, trying to stop the Messiah from uh, being born into the world. But God's word is true you, and you can't destroy what God has said. And then verse 26 says this, to Seth him also a son was born, he called his name Enosh, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Truth like a lie is passed from generation to generation. So you have Adam, and what's the new son now given to him? Seth, Adam, Seth, his son Enosh, and then it says men began to call on the name of the Lord. So you have a new line now, a new seed opposite of Cain's. And notice here, four generations down, Adam, Seth, Enosh, and then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Truth is taught and believed through here at least four generations. Later we're going to see it goes farther, there's more. But that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way the godly line is supposed to be. We pass truth from generation to generation. That's why we exist as a church. Why we exist as a church is not just to fellowship and enjoy each other and eat donuts and drink coffee and do all the different stuff we do, although we like to do all that stuff. Amen? Like to eat, like to have a good time. But we exist, our main reason, our main purpose is to be tellers of truth and transmitters of truth through the generations. So that, you know, truth lasts from generation to generation. And that's what the godly seed is about. And so it's not just physical generation. It doesn't mean that, you know, you have to have children. It means that spiritually there are descendants from us. There's people that our life is influenced and impacted. And how do we do that? Well, I think one way is we, it, it comes through living, not lecturing. And a lot of people talk a lot. And they lecture a lot. And they tell people, you know, uh, uh, about truth. But there's a component of that. But we need to put, I think, more emphasis on living it rather than lecturing people. Talk less. Walk more. That's how we're going to have impact.